Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences video podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews here in the studio today with Maynard Nexon, healthcare attorney, Matthew Roberts. Matthew, good to be with you. Good to see you. Joining us today on The Pulse is Adair Burroughs. She is the United States Attorney for the District of South Carolina. As the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Officer in the District, Adair and her office prosecute crimes impacting the state, including health care related fraud that we're going to dive into today. Adair, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Can you start us off by talking about your background uh, prior to your assignment as United States Attorney? Um, Yeah, so immediately prior to um, being in the chair, I was practicing in private practice doing complex civil litigation um, and some tax assistance organization work. But most of my career has been in the government nonprofit sectors. I actually started at the Department of Justice in D.C. in the Attorney General Honors Program doing tax cases across the country. So I have a particular propensity for fraud. I, I love fraud cases. Um, after I had kids, we moved back home to South Carolina and I worked for United States District Judge Richard Gergel um, for several years. I, after that, ran a nonprofit legal services provider called Charleston Legal Access um, and made a 2020 run for Congress. So ha- I've had a little bit of a varied career. <laughs> yeah, interesting career. Yes. Well, congratulations on your appointment. We're excited to have you in this spot. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your priorities for your first year as U.S. Attorney for South Carolina? Yeah, well, the first priority I had coming in the door was staffing up. We had a lot of um, staff loss and attorney loss during COVID, um, and we were just understaffed. And I really fo- wanted to focus on getting us back to our full fighting weight, as it were. Um, it takes a while to hire people here. We have to, all of our Employees have to go through a full FBI background check and that kind of thing. So I wanted to get that ball rolling quickly. Um, we had over 20 vacancies, including seven um, attorney vacancies. So I've been working really hard on that. And then the other priorities were to kind of set up. I have two substantive priorities that I wanted to get off the ground. Um, one is around gun violence and violent crime, which whatever I want the job to be, that is part of it in today's day and age. So we're getting some Project Safe Neighborhoods, um, uh, really evidence-based programs with community partnerships off the ground. And then the other thing, which is going to be more relevant to your office, is areas where we are the only protection the public has. We are the only game in town. And so that includes things like civil rights, um, but it also includes things like fraud against the government. There's no one else protecting U.S. taxpayer money. Um, we're it. And so... We have to be really playing in those elements. So we've done a lot, a lot of my work in that area for the first year. I've been focused on our civil enforcement team and really setting up a more more robust uh, practice around civil rights, but also making sure we have have some healthcare fraud experts that they have the resources they need um, to really run. So we've launched a healthcare task, uh, healthcare fraud task force. Um, run by two AUSAs here, Beth Warren on the civil side, Amy Bauer on the criminal side. We've pulled together numerous federal and state agencies. Um, That task force is launching. We had a two-day meeting just um, a couple weeks ago, our first kind of kickoff. So we're really kind of getting those areas up and running during the first year. Would that be part of the expansion that we've heard about at the U.S. Attorney's Office? Or is that just in general, you're growing the office. And then I guess that would translate into more prosecutions for fraud. Yeah. So there's, there's two parts of what you're seeing right now. One is not an actual expansion. It's just that we lost people and we needed to get back to our kind of pre COVID pre pandemic um, levels of enforcement and levels of staffing. And so you're saying that there's also new money in the 2023 budget for U.S. attorneys' offices across the country. Uh, Both Congress and the administration really recognized how um, under-resourced we were were for the amount of work we need to do on the behalf of the American people. And so there's a process right now about how those resources get divvied up. I have um, put in for a lot of positions, and um, we should hear about that in a couple months, I expect. But new attorney positions and new um, support staff positions to support specific things, um, 
specific priorities of the administration as well as Congress. So for instance, one of the positions um, I'm competing for is a as a AUSA to do nothing but COVID fraud cases. Um, there, I also am competing for positions um, to do civil rights work. So there's a variety of different positions out there and we'll know the outcome of that in a couple months. I see. We know the federal government has increased uh, its funding for fraud and abuse enforcement. And you mentioned that your office is the sort of the only game in town in terms of protecting the federal uh, system and its its spending of money within the healthcare system. Can you talk a little bit about your investigation of fraud and abuse cases? What's the policy behind that? Obviously, you want to protect the government's you know money, um, but how how do you look at these office these type of cases in the healthcare space? Yeah, so protecting the fisc and protecting taxpayer money is a big part of it. It's also protecting the public. So um, when we're prioritizing our fraud cases, you know, obviously we look at things like the amount of money, the egregiousness of the conduct. But one of our big driving uh, factors is patient harm. Or do we have things that involve patient harm or potential patient harm? with vulnerable uh, groups like the elderly or children or veterans. Um, So we wanna make sure we're protecting the public in these cases, as well as protecting the public fisc. Um, Yeah. So are there specific types of healthcare in the government's eyes that are more prone to to, uh, fraud and abuse investigations based on evidence or data that they've historically seen? Yeah, so kickbacks are really, big area for us. So like we have criminal enforcement, we have civil enforcement, we have both of those. And anytime we have a healthcare fraud case, no matter where it comes in the door or an allegation comes in the door, both the civil division and the criminal division look at that case. They look at it together and we make a decision about whether to pursue a civil remedy, a criminal remedy or both. And so we can talk about some of those factors if you're interested. Um, sure. But kickbacks are really a place uh, where you will see a lot of parallel. Uh, proceedings, which means there's criminal and civil, because the anti-kickback statute is criminal. There's our criminal remedy. But also when you have false claims that involve kickbacks, that's a per se violation of False Claims Act. Um, So we have really good legal hooks in the kickback space. Um, Like I said, we are also really interested in patient harm. So a big priority for us is drug diversion. Um, the, The drug diversion, especially in the opioid space, has caused a significant amount of harm in our community, as we know. Um, so those cases always get priority, and we're gonna we're gonna step in heavily when we see drug diversion issues. Um, I mean, there's all types of fraud. We see a lot. People <clears throat> get creative. <laughs> um, you know, you have the some of the common ones are obviously billing for services never rendered. Um, sometimes those cases involve stolen identities where um, they're billing on behalf of individuals that they've never contacted and have no contact with. So we worry about those victim stolen identities as well. Um, and obviously unnecessary tests, like all those kind of regular fraud things you see, but we've seen some creative ones too. So Right. Speaking of fraud, we've seen media reports, or I've seen media reports at least, uh, where the government does seem to be focusing on pandemic COVID-related fraud. And you mentioned uh, your office is competing for a prosecutor to focus just on that. But even before you would get that position, what have you seen so far in South Carolina? We've seen a lot. So in the healthcare space, um, the COVID fraud we see is uh, things like uh, when people get a drive-through test for COVID, um, they're billing Medicare and Medicaid for a full physician visit as if they come in and seen the doctor when all they did was a drive-through test. Um, and mm-hmm. someone comes in for a COVID test and they do a full respiratory panel, including we've seen a few that I find interesting for airborne chlamydia. We're just going to tack those right on there. Is unnecessary. Wow. <laughs> and patients never get these results. Um, so that kind of stuff happens in healthcare fraud. I will say when DOJ is talking about COVID fraud, most of this from a dollar perspective is not healthcare. It's things like the uh, PPP loans, EIDL loans. Mm. Um, We have a lot of people that have created fake businesses to get PPP loans and small business loans, Um, unemployment insurance fraud. Um, So those are some really big dollar cases where sometimes it's big dollars. Sometimes here in South Carolina, we've seen a lot of promoter stuff where 
any one individual case may not be a huge dollar amount, but what we find when we get into the investigation is you've got one person that is essentially selling fraud packages <clears throat> with fake businesses and stuff. So we want to take down those those networks. So when you hear COVID fraud, a lot of times it, it's monetarily a lot in those loan spaces, but we do have healthcare COVID fraud that is included in that that we, we tackle. I see. So I, hey, staying with the COVID theme, there were some um, waivers or lessening of enforcement of certain healthcare regulations during COVID start comes to mind. And those obviously have stopped now with the, the, the you know, ceasing the public health emergency. Um, do you anticipate any, you know, clawbacks to that area uh, at that time when Stark and other laws were not necessarily being enforced because of the public health emergency and because of the fact that we we're all having to do things different? Or do you anticipate things picking up from the, the, the PHE designation um, or the end of the PHE and then moving forward? Yeah, so in terms of like clawback to cover spaces where there was an enforcement, no. But picking up from now, yes, you're going right. to see increased enforcement going forward. Um, we are out of that public health emergency designation, and so we'll be we'll be increasing enforcement going forward on it. Right. Uh, and you talked about false claims. That's obviously a big part of the health care fraud and abuse, the Federal False Claims Act, which you know, allows for uh, relators, whistleblowers to bring a claim on behalf of the government, the government can intervene. And then if there's a recovery that the relator can get, can get a recovery. I think last year, DOJ, uh, recovered in excess of $2 billion from false claims cases in the fiscal year 2022. Do you anticipate, uh, increased activity in this area now that we're out of the PHE and hopefully you've got more staff, but, but do you anticipate we'll see more false claims cases? Yes, I do. Absolutely. In the last two years, our office has recovered $220 million in healthcare fraud. So we are punching above our weight um, in, in terms of compared to national numbers. Um, but we are we are expecting an increase. And part of it is we do have an expertise around healthcare fraud in my office, um, some really incredible attorneys. And this task force that we're setting up, part of the goal of this task force is to move those healthcare fraud cases move these false claim mass cases faster, more efficiently and effectively, right. which is going to give us capacity to do more and more of them. And as we step up more, that that will be true, too. So this is when I'm talking about this task force, we're talking about, you know, FBI, HHS, OIG, the VA, um, the AG's office and their their uh, Medi Medicaid fraud unit. We're all coming together, meeting quarterly. There's data mining. Um, we're really trying to step up how quickly we move these cases and so how fast we can do them and so that we have more capacity to do more. We have covered a lot of topics. Our time has flown by. It has. Um, Adair, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about so much with us today. You've had an interesting career. It sounds like it's just going to, that's going to be a theme that continues as you serve in your current role. But on behalf of everyone here at The Pulse, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having us and highlighting the work of our office. Yes, keep up the good work. Uh, on behalf of Matthew and the team here at The Pulse, thank you for everyone who watched our video podcast today. We hope you learned a little bit more about the federal side of enforcement and the protection of taxpayer money and people in general. And we look forward to seeing you next time right here on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and video and life sciences video podcast.